Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Fernando Miralles Villam, and I'm the Dean of the Mason College of Science. And I want to welcome you to this beautiful Potomac Science Center on this very special day. Um, I figured I'd do this video outdoors since I'm sure you're enjoying uh, the nice day um, there. Uh, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there with you in person. I'm traveling with my family on, on, a, on a long scheduled trip. Um, just this morning, uh, you know, I mean Saturday morning, uh, both my daughters uh, graduated. Uh, and uh, so I attended the commencement in the morning, traveling in the afternoon, and I had to miss the whole day. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm definitely delighted to welcome you here today. Uh, you know, as many of you know, um, I was appointed Dean uh, last spring. Um, uh, I accepted actually the position just a few days short of uh, the whole world being shut down in the pandemic. So it's been quite an interesting last, uh, you know, uh, year or so. Um, it is really my privilege um, as a new member of the Mason faculty uh, to welcome and honor uh, Professor Don Kelso, uh, who's a pioneer and a patriarch uh, of the college. Uh, since um, the last month of my arrival, I have read tributes uh, and heard from many faculty uh, about the tremendous impact Dr. Kelso had on Mason and on the College of Science, and most especially the lives of so many students. Uh, Professor Kelso has played a critical role in building the tremendous legacy of this college. As the first uh, freshwater ecologist to join the faculty, he is truly the cornerstone on which this beautiful research facility, the Potomac Science Center is built. Um, and while his research record is impressive and continues today through the Potomac Environmental Research and Education Center, uh, led by uh, his colleague and friend, Dr. Chris Jones, there can be really no greater accomplishment than to have uh, mentored and influenced so many students after so many years uh, spending so much time and energy, um, um, and, and, and students have come, uh, have come to me, have, have sent me emails, have called me, uh, calling Professor Kelso, uh, words from teacher, mentor, and friend. It's really, you know, there's really, it's very difficult to really match a legacy like that. Um, indeed, the movement to build the Don Kelso Learning Peer was initially the idea of a group of former students who worked with um, it's with Professor Kelso in the 1970s, actually, you know, going way back. Um, discussions have been underway for a while, as I understand, uh, probably at least two years. And uh, but it is their perseverance, the perseverance, and and uh, um, and that, that actually met the challenge. And and um, you know, we went through layers of university protocol, uh, combined with complications and delays of actually. Uh, building this uh, during a, a global pandemic, it's, it's indeed impressive and it's a great testament to their respect and, and their admiration and, and uh, for, for their mentor. Um, so today we're honored and overjoyed to hold the initial dedication of the Don Kelso Learning Pier. Um, Don, if I can call you Don, um, thank you for your dedication and commitment to building a young fledgling university into the globally respected R1 uh, institution that it is today. And thank you uh, for inspiring so many individuals to carry on your commitment to environmental issues and pursuits. Your legacy will be at work in the waters uh, you love for generations to come. I know there are many folks out there today who are eager to honor you. And I look forward to meeting you and Sandy and your family at the event planned for Labor Day weekend and thanking you personally for your many contributions to our university and our world. Thank you very much. And once again, welcome everyone. That's the problem when you're too short or too tall. That's never, never, a, uh, let's see. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Alonso Aguirre. I'm a professor and department chair for environmental science and policy. Uh, welcome, Professor Kelso and family. Welcome everyone to this magnificent event. I came to Mesa in 2011, I should say, in a different program that we work with the Smithsonian. Uh, and I met uh, Dr. Chris Jones, who was chair of the committee on that search. 
And we kind of hit it off from the beginning and he told me immediately about Peric. And he took me to a townhouse across the university. So this is Peric. No, 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 I'm gonna build up something big. And I said, where? At the Mel Belmont Bay. So I drove with my wife that winter uh, after being here for six or seven months. It was February. So I walked here with her. It was just uh, the little golf course and a little trail. We came close to the water. And lo and behold, we turned around and there was a bald eagle about 100 feet just catching a fish and it flew away. And then later on, you come in the summer and it's full of ospreys, all kinds of life and turtles. This pond has, you'll go out and you'll see a bunch of aquatic turtles. It is indeed an impressive facility. So I kind of drafted, actually stole some of these words from several proposals we've been writing, and I figure I'm supposed to give you some background in the department. And I learned actually just through Chris, the real contribution to the department, because I asked Chris, I need to write a story about our department. We're do, to developing a strategic plan for the dean. This guy is asking us now for strategic plans, and that's fantastic. And then we have to write a story of the department. So Chris sent me maybe a half a page, for how I said, is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's the department story. But then he read a three pages for Don, explain the whole story of the department. So now I'm gonna use that to incorporate into a strategic plan. I was going to tell you about uh, uh, Potomac, this area, when the Europeans arrived, were impressed because all the diversity and wildlife. But as, as Washington DC developed, uh, there was heavy impacts starting in the 40s, the big, the big explosion of natural resources. I mean, no, no species was more devastated by, by humans, like bison, for example. Uh, we, there were about uh, over 20 million bison roaming in the West, and we, the Europeans, were able to kill uh, most of them in less than 50 years. And that's what we did with many species around here, and we continue. However, um, interestingly, um, the 70s was a revolution for environment. Actually, it started with uh, President Kennedy in the 60s, where he wanted to approve many of the uh, Clear Water Act, uh, Air Act, uh, and the New Space Act that was actually co written by uh, a famous, one of the famous professors at the Statue of Dawn, and that was Dr. Lee Talbot that recently passed away. So I'm so happy that we have the opportunity here to, to have Dr. Kelso and really see his accomplishments to university. I just met him recently, uh, but I, I heard about him like almost every day between Bob Jonas and Chris Jones, always talking about you and always sharing experiences uh, with students. I mean, and we have a very supportive faculty here's uh, uh, Cindy, for example, Dan, always uh, supporting us in many ways. And so I understand that the program uh, became a hub in about 2000, when the department was established with the first PhD degree for uh, the state of, the, I guess, in the, in the world, because really for the United States in environmental science and policy. And that's extremely important to emphasize because most of the programs in the US is environmental science or environmental policy and not together, only two or three programs, and three of them are Ivy Leagues, have this connection. However, this is the first one. I can tell you, for example, that uh, since uh, fall 2011, uh, that's the data I was able to retrieve last minute yesterday, we have mentored over 1,522 students, 920 PhDs, 602 master students, and despite being uh, only 10 years old, our undergrad program now is at 187 students, growing 8 to 15% a year, depending on the year. Doesn't include the 117 students of the, the BA that was assigned to a different college. Still, faculty like Cindy, like Jen, like Dan are heavily involved in supporting those students on the BA in sustainability. Um, we play a major role in, in many aspects of policy, science, and the environment. We are uh, really um, training the people in government agencies, NGOs, in, um, in many businesses that will help us uh, succeed long-term. So I'm very pleased that um, Dr. Kelso and his family are here 
uh, to to enjoy a wonderful day. I'll let Chris take over the mic. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. And we're doing alternating mics so they can clean the podium um, in between. Thank you, Alonzo. And um, I want, I want to join our Dean and Department Chair in welcoming you to this beautiful facility on the tidal Occoquan River Potomac Science Center. And I want to, of course, especially recognize the Kelso clan <laughs> and, and uh, they're here supporting their, their beloved Don and uh, we're so delighted to have you. I also want to thank the Dean because he's given us $50,000 to do the feasibility study for the dock. So without that, we wouldn't have step one in the, in the process. So, uh, and that, and that was, that was a challenge because as you know, universities are not, are having some financial uh, tightening, belt tightening. So that was fantastic. Okay, well, first a little bit about our honoree, although many, most of you know him. Um, he was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, far from the ocean, but reminiscent of Rachel Carson, marine and freshwater ecology called out to him. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> it sounded poetic. <laughs> After a BS at the University of Tennessee, Don got his marine ecology immersion and PhD uh, in PhD work at the University of Hawaii. I think that's right. Couldn't find your CV, it's gotten, at any rate. So just a little perspective as Alonzo was alluding to, G, as to where Don fits in with GMU. GMU founded as a two-year program of UVA in 1959, moved to the current Fairfax campus in 1964 and became an independent four-year institution in 1972. The MS in biology started soon thereafter. Thus, when John, Don joined GMU in 1970, he was there virtually at the beginning of its life as a college. Over the course of the next 35 years, Don played an enormous role in the development of the biology department. And in the early 1980s, early 1980s, uh, part of the team that developed the first PhD in environmental science uh, and public policy. Uh, it was the first PhD program in the sciences at George Mason University. Um, soon thereafter, Don and I, in collaboration with Fairfax County, initiated the Gunston Cove study, the longest continuous monitoring program in the Bay region. Um, over the years, Don served many roles in the biology department, instructor, advisor to graduates and undergraduates, committee member, and most importantly, field trip leader. Um, and there are many, many stories about Don's field trips, <laughs> some of which he shared with us in a, in a document for his retirement party. And I'm not sure how many of those we went over, but I still have it. I got the evidence, okay? If I need it, I got the evidence. So over the years, uh, so, um, he, um, so um, and we've compiled a list of students Don mentored as students in his coastal and estuarine ecology class, graduate committee member or thesis advisor, and it contains a breathtaking total of 274 students. And I have yet to talk to any student who didn't love and admire Don. To say this building was a long time in coming is an understatement. I think that from the time Don arrived at GMU, it was a dream of his. And when I arrived in 1980, we became a tag team looking for a place that would provide students with direct hands-on experience of the Potomac River or somewhere on the Bay. And then when Bob Jonas joined us in 1985, he adopted the dream too. So one question was, why wasn't there already a marine lab on the Potomac River? Well, Virginia's main marine lab was Virginia Institute of Marine Science on the York River and Old Dominion University had oceanographic facilities in Norfolk. So they weren't, they were busy. They didn't need the Potomac. Maryland had major facilities at the mouth of the Patuxent River, CVL, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, 
and on the main bay at Horn Point Laboratory. Yet the Potomac is the second largest tributary of the bay after the Susquehanna and is the largest of the sub estuaries of the bay. So clearly there was a need. Well, the answer can be found in the fact that the tidal Potomac is an interstate river, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Furthermore, the state line runs along the Virginia shoreline. So Virginia had only the bays on its side and Maryland was busy elsewhere. The DC universities did not have strong environmental programs. They tended to focus on biomedical biology. The Smithsonian actually had a lab on the water, but it was on the main bay south of Annapolis. So clearly there was a niche to be filled. We just had to figure out how to fill it, <laughs> where to get the resources. So Don started filling this niche in the 70s through contracts and class visits. Fairfax County awarded him a contract to do ecological studies of all the watersheds in the county cataloging their biological diversity systematically for the first time. And of course, Don brought his cadre of inspired students to bear on this study. As for the tidal Potomac River, Don's aquatic ecology classes collected data at Gunston Cove and other sites on the Potomac and Chesapeake Bay annually. By the mid 1970s, Mason had established the MS program in biology and Don sponsored students doing MS theses on various aspects of the river. One example is the study of Canes Creek right across the river here that was done by our alumni leader, uh, Chris Powell. I won't try to tell you about all the leads Don and I checked out over the years in our efforts to fund, to get a lab on the river. But one in particular led to our current facility. Harry Diamond Labs was a one square mile Cold War antenna facility located at the end of the Belvoir Peninsula. The base was slated to be closed and Don and I put in a bid to take it over. Unfortunately, federal agencies got first choice and Fish and Wildlife Service got it and appropriately it's now the Occoquan Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, but in the meantime, we met the developer of this uh, area, Belmont Bay, Preston Carruthers, who was crafting a unique development on the shores of the tidal Occoquan just upstream from the, from the uh, Perry Diamond Labs. He wanted something distinctive for the development and partnered with the Virginia Science Museum to bring a full-fledged science museum, Smithsonian's like, uh, to, to, the to the development with George Mason's aquatic program as an adjunct. Much time and effort was spent over almost a decade, I think, to bring this science museum to fruition, but in the end, it didn't happen. Mason then picked up the ball with the urging of Don and I and the unfailing support of our then Dean, Vikas Shantok. And I have to tell you that without Vikas, we wouldn't be here. And Peter Stearns. Um, the rest, as they say, is history. Now we have a great state-of-the-art building on the river. What is lacking to make us a first-class marine aquatic lab is easy access to our vessels and to the river itself. The Don Kelso Learning Pier will provide that missing link. In summary, without Don's original dream, action, and persistence, we would not be standing here today. I am proud to call him my friend, my mentor, and my inspiration in so many ways. Thanks, Chris. I continue learning from Chris and Don, who were my co-advisors when I got my PhD here uh, a little over 20 years ago. Time flies, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, and now I'm a professor in environmental science and policy and you know, thankful to carry on both of your legacies and, and particularly, obviously, Don, uh, as I'll talk about it, in it over the next few moments. Before I start, I want to join in welcoming Don, Sandy, your progeny, your whole family. Um, we are all together here as living testament uh, to the exceptional aloha spirit uh, of this wonderful man. And welcome and thank you all for joining us. So, As a teacher, I learned from Don Kel so long ago that it can be really enjoyable to learn together with students, with uh, colleagues and with alumni. You don't have to just teach, you can actually learn with them, right? And um, so I decided to apply this pedagogical approach to crowdsource my remarks here in order to learn what others um, from with others what makes him such an amazing teacher, colleague, and human being. So I'll start with uh, Sean Gagnon. Um, 
He recalls spending his sophomore summer re recounting aqua uh, sorry, counting aquatic wildlife with you aboard Mason Sea Ox. He says, quote, great guy and very fond memories. Give it to him, Don. <laughs> Chris Jones uh, just remarked about how students loved your estuarine's um, ecology class. To, Mason advisee, to my master's advisee, Rob Johnson, it was one of the best classes I ever taken. In fact, in my 1990s peers and I agree with Rob's assessment that it was a, a, a great combination of hands-on activities and, clans, and classroom lessons. The friendships we formed, uh, we forged in our field trips to the Chesapeake Bay and Delmarva's Del Atlantic Lagoons, we sustained those friendships a quarter century later, thanks to your largely to your inviting every student to be an equal partner of your crew and research team. Thank you for that. I approached your, um, your very first advisee, um, Chris Powell, for his perspective. Now that's Chris's story to tell um, next, but I just wanted to let you know that we'll also try to do our best to capture highlights of, what, of, the, of in our tribute to him, uh, to you, I'm sorry, in our tribute to you in Mason's Spirit Magazine this fall. So look for a full page glossy with you in the you know, <laughs> bikini and everything, right? Um, but we're looking forward to, to featuring uh, this article in, in the fall magazine. So look forward to having that ready, hopefully before our September meeting. For me, your wonder-filled, wide-embracing approach to education has deeply inspired my own learning, my teaching style, and my career over the past 30 years. You introduced me to unimaginable, uh, unimagined aquatic life. The winged sea robin, which I actually learned was a featherless fish that breached the waves trying to escape um, our trowel net. And I kid you not, the one that got away, didn't get away, an 18-inch mantis shrimp. Its vorpal claws a blur as it sliced everything in, alive in our, eight, in our five gallon bucket into fine sashimi. If I had been with my wife at that time, she probably would have enjoyed the sashimi we uh, created that day, right? Um, uh, as a doctor, as my doctoral co-advisor, you humbly ask sage questions like, how would sea level rise 10 meters effect, of, of 10 meters affect the Chesapeake Bay? And of course I thought the short answer is, there would be no Chesapeake Bay, but it was my doctoral exam, so I wrote another three pages after that. So thanks for challenging me on that one. You also taught me how to overcome my early seasickness and enjoy boat-based research. And you showed me that, that sheets of seaweed on the Delmarva beaches were actually edible laver. Considering a seafood dinner, I brought some back to our cabin this, that evening. You know where I'm going this with this now, don't you, Don? Yeah, I thought you might pick up on it. So putting that laver to better use, I improvised a Halloween costume that night. You might recall how I played King Neptune, uh, all decked out with a mop of seaweed draped over my head. After my jolly green ghoul accused you of deep sea abandonment, we laughed so hard that Davy Jones' locker must have shook with laughter. Don, seriously, you embody, whoa. You embody so much of what we cherish in learning and discovery at Mason. You are wise, modest, humorous, resourceful, and kind. You naturally invite and help students to learn with you, not just from you. And you gently encourage us to take responsibility for our own learning and its successful application. I greatly admire you for all of that. In fact, generations of students and colleagues re re also revere you now. Considering, consider our colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Parkinson's, describing you as, as just, just the nicest person, he suggested a new title for you, quote, the Mr. Rogers of estuarine ecology, <laughs> unquote. He has that British humor you just can't keep up with. Meanwhile, Chris Powell has, has uh, spent years of championing, championing this creation of the Don Kelso Learning Pier here at Mason's Potomac Science Center. He now leads our alumni effort to raise and build uh, support to build the pier. He's recruited Chris Jones and five of Mason alumni graduates um, as co-chairs for this campaign. As we saw, the College of Science Dean has resourced the feasibility study, and even your crewmen, as I mentioned before, Mr. Uh, Sean Gagnon is on board. He's doing the civil engineering and environmental work. Uh, before lifting off anchor, lifting anchor, he wrote me to say, quote, I'll be out on a boat counting SAV, just like the good old days. So now once again, it's all hands on deck as we gather to pay our tribute to one who has so selflessly provided so much to so many, the Mr. Rogers of Estuarine Ecology. From the benthos of all our hearts, thank you, Dr. Don Kelso.
I guess I get to be the next one up here that gets uh, to roast them, toast them. <laughs> Don, <laughs> I really, I, I, I wrote something to say, but I'm not the kind of person that really follows the script. And uh, you ask anybody that knows me, um, <laughs> I don't follow anything. <laughs> I, I do, I do my own thing. But it really is a privilege to be up here and to be doing this today because it's. It's kind of the, the thing that we've been talking about for a long time is I was here with Chris and with uh, Gary Johnston and, and a couple of the friends uh, to get a tour of the facility. And I said, gosh, we have to find something to dedicate to Don at this facility, because I know that he took me, Chris, to that facility down in the bo boonies down here to show me the, uh, the, the Henry Diamond Lab or whatever it was. And you know, your dream was to have something down here. I remember him telling me that. And I said, well, let's anybody can do it, he can. So anyway, I thought, well, you know, Don has provided a lot of people with access to the water through his science, through his field trips. And I'll tell you about those in a minute. <laughs> He's provided an awful lot of opportunity. And uh, it would be a real honor for him to have a pier named after him, which would provide people with access to the water. And uh, when Chris and I, and a couple other people toured this facility, one of the things that we really noticed was absolutely spectacular building beautiful place but when the tide goes out you can't even put a boat in the water so it was like let's build a pier you know i've had some experience in the past uh, i worked for fish and wildlife in rhode island did a lot of permit work and i said we can do it i know we can do it it's just going to take a little bit of effort but i know we can do it so we proposed it chris thought it was a great idea we went forward with a couple of meetings with with audrey and carrie and some other people in the room here and uh, came up with a plan. I put together a conceptual drawing that uh, based on Chris's desires and needs for the, for the university here and for the facility. And everybody thought it was great. And then we started thinking about how are we gonna do this? When can we get this thing going? And Gary Johnson, who's in the back of the room here, one of my uh, classmates in, in, in grad school, he said, why don't we dedicate the existing pier to Don and make that phase one? I said, boy, that's a wonderful idea. You know, they built this little short pier out here with a float on it, beautifully done, but it's a perfect launching pad for a real pier that's going to go out to enough water where you can actually do something. So we figured, okay, we'll call that phase one. We'll do this dedication. Don will have phase one dedicated and phase two, which I'll talk about in a little while. Phase two is the actual completion and getting it to a point where we can actually use it. But anyway, as, as I said, I was, I was Don's first graduate student. At least he told me that. <laughs> I don't remember that, but I think he told me I was his first graduate student and I was a little tough to get along with sometimes, but uh, he and I had a great time. Uh, we bought the first research boat for the, for the university, the Gunston, which is a Ken craft that we drove to North Carolina to bring back. And then I having a little bit of experience outfitting boats has been a sailor all my life. Uh, I outfitted the boat for him and uh, actually Ended up doing my master's research, like Chris said, across the creek right over there on Canes Creek. I spent many a night, many a day sampling eggs and larval fish and, and small fish in that creek under Don's guidance. So that was terrific. So his influence on me is just, is just tremendous. Um, then he, he hired myself, Cheryl Bright, who's sitting in the back of the room, Chuck Parker, Gary Johnson, a bunch of us to help him do the stream survey work in Fairfax County. We sampled every single stream in Fairfax County for fish and invertebrates. And that's how I learned fish. And I still remember all the scientific names, <laughs> believe it or not. So that was, quite a, that was quite a treat. We really enjoyed that. And it also created a really close friendship with ourselves and, and people that I still have close friendships with over the years. Um, Don taught at the university and I encouraged him. I said, Don, we need more courses in marine science. We need more courses in aquatic science. And, he taught freshwater ecology, he taught marine ecology, he taught ichthyology, he taught tropical ecosystem. I took all the courses I could from him. I was here as an undergraduate, and then I came back and, and, and did graduate school here also under Don. And uh, Don was really the one who encouraged me to go on and, and go to grad school. He said, you really can do it, just do it. So he was, he was kind of the mentor that really got me going. And through all these courses, we did a lot of field trips. One thing I will say about Don Kelso is that he's a hands-on biologist. And you really wanted students to feel that you got to get out there and get wet. You got to get out there and get dirty, you know, if you're going to really learn about science. So we did field trips everywhere. I mean, if you wanted field trips, Don's courses were the ones to take. We did the Shenandoah. We did Eastern Shore of Maryland. We stayed in a lighthouse 
in a or lighthouse coast guard station in the Delaware Bay and sampled in Delaware Bay. Uh, we sampled in the Chesapeake, we sampled the Potomac River. And then I took tropical ecosystems from them. And that was a great course. We all went to Jamaica. Again, he wanted everybody to experience all the ecosystems. And the one island that has all of them is Jamaica. So we spent a week. We had just as many faculty and advisors as we had students. We had a wonderful time. Um, Cheryl in the back of the room will tell you about sleeping on horsehair mattresses. <laughs> she forbid me to use her name, but anyway, but Cheryl's been a friend for years and uh, she didn't like the horsehair mattress we slept on in this one uh, place we stayed in the mountains. But anyway, that was a phenomenal trip and we really learned a lot about tropical ecosystems. The other trip, which I really have to tell people about was Don liked to do things whether you thought they could be done or not. Many times we said, this is impossible. We're not going to do this. Um, he taught marine ecology and this area has a certain ecosystem for marine ecology. So we saw a lot of those areas and we did. He said, well, we're gonna to go to New England and we're gonna see the ecosystems up in New England. He planned a trip over Thanksgiving weekend. We got into the vans. We drove from here to Woods Hole, Massachusetts, slept in the vans that morning <laughs> or part of the night in Woods Hole at the oceanographic lab there got on the ferry the next day with the vans, went to Martha's Vineyard, spent two days over Thanksgiving weekend <laughs> in a youth hostel and saw all the ecosystems up there. There was salt marshes, there was rocky shores, there was everything. And then we got back in the vans and drove all the way back to Mason. <laughs> so it was like a three day field trip to New England. And I could tell you, I just drove down on the other day and it took me 10 hours to get from Rhode Island to here. <laughs> so it was uh, back in the days when I guess there wasn't as much traffic, but. If Don wanted to do it, he did it. And uh, we had a phenomenal field trip that year and it was just terrific. So, but as I said, he, he inspired all of us. We bought the first boat together. We went down to North Carolina to buy the, the Gunston, which was the old Ken craft that we had. Uh, we used for years and I understand from Chris Jones, it was finally retired after many, many years of service. Uh, and, I, and I hate to tell you, I worked for Fish and Wildlife for 25 years and was charged with putting together a juvenile finfish survey of Narragansett Bay, which is not quite as big as Chesapeake Bay. It's probably about the size of the Potomac River. But I bought a Kencraft. I bought the exact same boat <laughs> and used it for 25 years on Narragansett Bay. So it was a great boat. So my, my career in fisheries, and I'm a fisheries biologist, so that was my training, uh, what I did when I left. But I, I was at the Smithsonian for a while. I was at National Marine Fisheries for a while, did at sea research with them. I worked at the University of Rhode Island, graduate school of oceanography. And then I finally got a job with the National with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife Marine Fisheries. And it's all because of this man. <laughs> he was really an inspiration. And still is. When I retired from Rhode Island Fish and Wildlife, one thing I wanted to do was teach. So I was, I had friends at Roger Williams University and they said to me, well, you'd like to teach some classes here? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I taught invertebrate and vertebrate zoology, marine invertebrate and marine vertebrate zoology at labs at the Roger Williams University for about 10 years. I loved it, but I took a lot of what I knew from Don. And again, I got students in the field. I got them muddy, I got them dirty, I got them wet. And uh, all I remember was the good days when I did it with Don and his classes. So. Over the years, it's, it's really been a great trip and I really, really enjoyed it. And I attribute this whole thing to Don. And uh, proposing this peer is something that I thought was, uh, was very small compared to what he's contributed to the rest of us, but it'll be a lasting memory and I think it'll go on forever. Um, and the whole process, I mean, we started this in March of, 19, of 2019. So it has been, Chris, it has been two years <laughs> since you and I first talked about it. And then in the meantime, through a number of Zoom sessions, and I just went through my emails the other day, Audrey, and I bet I have a thousand emails from Audrey, and <laughs> Audrey is a development person here, and, and it was Audrey who was really leading the charge, and Carrie who's leading the, the facilities charge on doing this. Uh, I'm sure they got tired of me sometimes, because I could be a little overbearing, but uh, we're getting it done, and I, and I think we're going to come out with a product that everybody's going to be really, really happy with. So. Or a lot of other people at the university. I mean, Chris has been very supportive of us. And uh, some of the other people at George Mason have helped. Marie, who's set up today, Marie Callie, and, and the other people at the university that's, that have helped in this whole effort. So 
But I really want to thank uh, also my co-chairs. I drafted them into this. Um, Cheryl Bright, who's in the back, Gary Johnston, Chuck Parker. It was kind of the, the Kelso's crew with a K, spelled with a K, crew with a K. We were the ones that, that Don hired to do the stream work. So we formed this uh, kind of coalition between the four of us to try to get this project done. So we will, we will get it done, I guarantee. There will be a peer out there. It just takes time. It takes time to do it right. So I'm really pleased to, to, to be here today, and I'm so glad we're having this dedication of this peer to, to Don. Um, we will be using this opportunity also to kick off a campaign. Um, Audrey gave me permission to say that this is the official kickoff of the uh, Don Kelso Learning Peer fundraising campaign. So those 200 and something students that Don had and everybody that we can get a hold of will certainly be solicited to help us raise the funds to build this peer. Um, the other avenue that we're going to follow also would be a National Science Foundation grant. So we're looking at both avenues and we're not going to give up on either one because no matter what happens, you know, we will need the money and the resources to not only build the peer, but to also maintain it and to do the, what's necessary to build it. Um, it will have K through 12 educational opportunities on it also. So Cindy Smith, is she here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was uh, really would like to see more opportunities for K through 12. Um, if you saw the rendering of the peer out there, it's gonna have four slips at the end. It's gonna have the end for a larger research vessel and there'll be a, a lower float system where smaller boats can be launched like canoes and kayaks. And it will also give students access to the water to do sampling. So. You know, youth education programs are really critical. And I think uh, they're the ones that are gonna be sitting here someday doing the same thing we're doing today. So anyway, I'd really like to thank everybody for being here. Um, we're gonna have a big celebration. Now, with COVID, we have no idea what was gonna happen. We had no idea whether we were gonna be able to get together. And whenever they said that we could do this, I was on the phone with Audrey right away. I said, we gotta do this. <laughs> we have to have an in-person event if we can. So that's why you're here today even though we're limited in the number of people we can invite, but we are on Labor Day weekend gonna have a huge celebration, I hope, of this whole effort and everybody get a chance. And we're hoping that'll be a good time for all of Don's former students to come and to really greet each other and to, to reminisce about old times, but because uh, we have some great stories. <laughs> can I tell one story, Don? One that I can finish with? <laughs> I will tell you one story. Maybe Gary Johnson could tell it better, but I will tell you the story. And Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, is Don and had done a lot of research down in the Tortuguero estuary in, in Costa Rica, um, actually with Archie Carr, who's the turtle guy, and with Carter Gilbert. And uh, we were planning to go down there to do some more work years ago. And unfortunately, I got into a car accident and broke my femur. So I couldn't go, much to my disappointment. So but Gary was going to go. Gary, did you get to go in my place? Yeah. yeah, Gary got to go in my place because Gary was one of Don's students, but there was another person that went with him. And uh, I guess they were on the Tortuguero estuary one night doing some work. And I guess the boat kind of ran up onto a log somewhere. And uh, the motor conked out. And I guess the guy who was with him, the guide or the person that was helping him, decided to go to the bow to see if he couldn't help push it off. And Don put the motor into reverse. Wait, the motor was in reverse. He pulled the cord and the motor started, the boat went backwards and the guy went over the bow. <laughs> didn't get hurt, but, <laughs> and Gary said they looked and they looked and he didn't come up and he didn't come up and, and finally he popped up laughing his head off. <laughs> so, you know, fortunately nothing happened, but it was just one of those funny that, believe me, I've done the same thing. You know, you forget the boats in, in gear and you pull the pull cord and uh, you go the opposite direction. So that was funny. Gary thought that was quite entertaining. And unfortunately the guy was fine and everything was fine, but. Don's a great guy. He's really a lot of fun to be in the field with. So wish we could do more. So anyway, I will end there. And uh, I forget who's the next person that comes up. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Okay, I'm Pat Gelevin. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology and the Associate Dean of Research for the College of Science, who is also a professor in the ESP as well. All right. So I've known Don for a long while now. I, I met him when I first came to the university in 1993. Okay, so it goes, we go a, a, a way back. We've seen a lot of change at the university. All right. 
Uh, we've seen the university grow from an undergraduate teaching institute to a full-fledged R1 uh, institute now on three campuses. All right. um, a significant aspect of that growth has been the development of the environmental science program here at the university. Um, it's culminated in a long struggle, okay, by the, the founding uh, faculty here to put this building in place. Okay, so I'll point out that um, it was just, it was Chris. Okay, it was Don, it was also Bob Jonas who couldn't be here today. All right. um, I can actually remember working with Chris the first year I got here on plans for a molecular lab out here at the Science Center, okay. So GMUNA has a full-fledged, okay, environmental science and policy program. It's world-class, all right. So I think uh, we're gonna want to show our appreciation with and the tenacity and dedication to making this happen, okay? It's been a long haul, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get Don, I'm gonna move Don up front here. I'm gonna ask Chris. Okay, Chris, if you can come up here. Okay, Chris, This is, this is, you're showing the, the real one. Yeah, showing the real one. There will be a space here if you get a chance to have a look at it. You guys are just running over some stairs now and you realize there's a lot of this side. Fortunately, there's not enough water which is about 500 feet. <laughs> anyway, at the base of the pier, the left of the gates, be a bronze plaque. The George Bates, John, John Kelso, Larry Peer, George Bates University's first community colleges, September 1970, May 2006, retired. They dedicated to Dr. John Kelso, founded George Bates programs in freshwater fishery and marine biology, marine ecology, dedicated summer of 2021. There's no date on it because we weren't sure what the date was going to be. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that, that would be a bronze plaque forever. Mounted on the state gate down there. And then we have this one. And then we have the state program. Okay. And this one we're going to present uh, the presentation. Don called me the other day and he said, well, what do you want me to say? And I said, well, this is your thing. <laughs> You're welcome to say whatever you like to say or nothing. I'm more than happy to say whatever you want to say. Well, this group knows me better than I know myself. Uh, we've been through storms and we've been through droughts and we always came out smiling. It shows us that the Lord is good despite what we do. I think that this part, my, my heart is closer to your heart than any other aspect of my life has been. I appreciate your all contributions and guidance and your patience. I always felt blessed with the students that I had and you all are the ideal example of that. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but together we found out things we could do. I wish I could do it all again. Same students. 
<laughs> so thank you very much for your presence here today. Thank you for sharing the love. And I hope that you'll find somebody else in your life that will give you love. That's the most important thing. Thank you.